Welcome to EPG Patshala. This paper is the philosophy of law. The current module is entitled Introduction to Principles of Natural Justice. The objectives of this module are to understand the concept of natural justice and see how it plays out in the Indian context. This module was written by Shivraj Hachanavar from the University of Uttaranchal in Dehradun. I'm Akash Singh Rator from the Lewis University of Rome. Justice is the first and essential principle of an orderly society. But what is meant by justice has no accepted definition. There are a number of classifications of justice based on various theories. For example, there's the divine command theory, which suggests that justice is what God commands. There's natural law theory, which we've discussed in earlier modules. There's social contract theory. There are distributive theories of justice. There are a number of different approaches to justice. And unfortunately, till date, there has been no widely accepted comprehensive view of justice that can take into account all of these rival versions. One dominating idea of justice, which has wide traction in the Anglo-American world, is that presented by John Rawls in his Theory of Justice in 1971. In this uh, work, Rawls proposes that justice consists of essentially two elements, two principles. He refers to them as the two principles of justice. The first principle is known as the liberty principle. According to this, each person is to have an equal right of the most extensive basic liberties compatible with the same liberties for all. So no one should have a, a greater amount of liberty than anybody else. The second is more towards equality rather than liberty. It suggests that social and economic inequalities are to be arranged that two conditions apply. The first is that they are to be understood to give the greatest benefit to the least advantaged members of society. So if you deviate from the liberty principle, you should do it in such an extent that it only advantages the least advantaged. And the second aspect of this equality principle is that there should be a fair equality of opportunity. So this two principles of justice, liberty and equality, with the difference principle and the fair equality of opportunity, prevent the framework within which we can understand what justice is in the Rawlsian conception. So we can see that we can extract a number of basic principles that follow from these two principles of justice. For example, there should be fair and equitable treatment of all individuals before the law. There should be a fairness in the protection of rights, and that entails of also, of course, a punishment of wrongs. That every person should be rendered his due. That everybody's life and property should be protected by law, and that there should be a fair and equitable, equitable distribution of liberties as well as liabilities. So these are some principles that can be derived from the basic two principles of justice in Rawls's philosophy. What we will notice as we continue to discuss natural justice is that what is articulated in these derived principles are in perfect conformity with the ba basic view of natural justice. So this concept of natural justice has a long history. It derives in, uh, the, in, in the English language from the Latin jus naturale and lex naturale, the Roman words for natural justice or natural law. What they suggested was that the customary law or the laws in place should have some kind of conformity or linkage to the eternal immutable laws of nature or laws, for example, that the gods condone. In plain words and in more secular language, Natural justice is a name for those basic principles and procedures that govern the adjudication of disputes between persons and between persons and organizations, so that each party in this dispute should feel like fair processes have occurred. This is the heart of natural justice, however it's articulated in uh, specifics in various uh, cultures and contexts. One such context is, of course, the one closest to home in India. In ancient India, just as well as in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, principles of natural justice were well recognized between kings and courts and parties to disputes. For example, Brihaspati says, and I quote, 
a judge should decide cases without any consideration of personal gain or any kind of personal bias, and his decision should be in accordance with the procedure prescribed by the texts, the legal texts, of course. So this is a very clear statement of the principles of natural justice. No bias, no personal gain, and so on. Similarly, Katyayana says, and I quote, if the king wants to inflict upon the litigants, those are the parties to the dispute, an illegal or unrighteous decision, then it's the duty of the judge to warn the king and prevent him. So in other words, there was a separation of powers so that the executive, if he was going to do something that violated principles of natural justice, the executive should be warned by a counselor or a judge. So in ancient India, we have here two clear examples of the principles of natural justice, which seem to be more or less ancient and universal and continue to this day. Well, the English legal system, which began to systematize principles of natural justice into contemporary common law, and those aspects of contemporary common law are still in effect in uh, India's um, uh, uh, legal system, these dated back, or rather received a kind of inspiration from elements of uh, biblical law and, um, uh, per uh, and allegories that appeared in the Bible. For example, you can think of the very opening book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve in the uh, Garden of Eden were forbidden to eat from the uh, tree of life and the tree of good and evil. They ate from this, uh, uh, they ate the fruit of this tree, commonly believed to be an apple. And uh, before God meted out the punishment that they were to uh, 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 get uh, as a consequence of disobeying God's command and eating this um, apple from the tree of good and evil, God asked each uh, Eve and Adam to appear before him and explain the reasons why they violated the command. So the English, in the process of institutionalizing natural justice in the 17th and 18th century, often referred to this basic biblical story to say, look, even from the very moment of creation, God employed the principles of natural justice by calling each accused party to appear and speak and defend themselves prior to passing judgment upon them. So what comes out of this process of institutionalizing the ancient principles of natural justice uh, through the English uh, 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 legal history of the 17th up to the uh, 19th century? Well, we get basically three main components to what we regard as universal natural justice that must be procedurally implemented into the law of every single uh, country and institution. These are the first, in, I'll say them in Latin and then translate them, the first is nemo debet esse judex in propria causa. That means that um, nemo debet, no man can be a judge in his own case. So no person can be a judge to his own case. This is known as the rule against bias, because clearly, if I'm one of the litigants, I can't be an impartial or unbiased decision maker in that process. This is the first principle of natural justice. A second principle we've just heard in terms of Adam and Eve being called before God to uh, speak their uh, defense. It is audi alterem partem. What that means is that no one shall be condemned unless heard. So, uh, uh, audi alterem patem means hear out the other side. In other words, if two people are arguing, we must listen, we must hear out both of the parties to the dispute. It would violate the principles of natural justice just to hear one party and ignore another party. So, just so God pulled forth, uh, uh, brought forth before him both Eve and Adam to uh, give an account or give a defense for their behavior. Subsequently, he, he, uh, 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 he punished them. The third is a most uh, recent addition. This is the idea of reasoned decisions, or in India we refer, refer to this as speaking orders. 
I'm going to explain more the nature of these reasoned decisions or speaking orders, but first let's take each of the uh, three principles in turn. We begin with nemo debet es se judex in propria causa. So this rule against bias is often stated as follows. When there is a dispute between two parties, the judge shall always be an impartial third party. So we introduce the element of a third party because you can ensure impartiality. Well, it doesn't ensure impartiality, but it's a necessary condition to, have, to achieve impartiality. The judge cannot be a relative, a friend, an enemy, or otherwise related to the subject matter of the litigation. Now the word bias basically means anything which tends or may be regarded as tending to cause a person to decide a case otherwise than on the evidence. So if a person is to decide the case exclusively on the evidence, then that person is unbiased. If the person is to let other factors than the evidence influence the way he decides a case, then that person is biased. Now the principle of natural justice demands that there should be no bias for a just resolution. There are four kinds of bias that we can recognize. First is personal bias, second is pecuniary bias, third is subject matter bias, and fourth is departmental bias. Let's take a moment to understand each of these. Personal bias is the most simple to understand. It arises when the, the, uh, the person who is the judge is in some way interested in a certain outcome because of his um, uh, relation or friendship or enmity with one of the parties to the decision. So personal bias has to be overcome by the careful selection of the third party. Pecuniary bias is also fairly straightforward. The deciding authority or the impartiality of the judge is determined by having no financial interest in the outcome of the case. So if the judge has some sort of financial interest, if he's been paid to reach a decision, obviously that decision would violate the principles of natural justice since the decision is not based on the evidence, it's based on the income, the, uh, the bribe that the judge has received. Subject bias gets a little bit more complicated because in this case, the judge has a, an impartiality that's expressed because the matter of interest, the matter that's in dispute, is interesting to this judge in some academic or technical way. Or perhaps the judge has already taken a stand on this in a previous case, and he wants to reinforce his previous case. There are a number of ways in which a judge can decide outside of the evidence because of his interest in the subject. Finally, we come to departmental or official bias. This kind of bias arises when the adjudicating authority, so the third party, the judge, is acting under extreme departmental influence or circumstances where his independence or impartiality can't be assumed. So let's take the case, for example, that a, a judge is attempting to decide between um, a, a litigant who is challenging the judiciary. So if the, if the um, we can take, for example, a contempt of court case. Let's say that a particular person has been found in contempt of court and is sentenced to three months in jail. That person appeals the contempt of court order to a higher uh, court. Well, judges all have a departmental or institutional bias in supporting the power of judges as such. Right? So a higher level judge wouldn't want to undermine the, the authority of a judge as judge by uh, removing that um, contempt of court order. So there might be an institutional bias built in to the possibility of appealing a contempt of court order. This could be a problem that faces the, the, the judiciary. If the judiciary is infected with this problem, then it's clear that the judiciary is violating basic principle of natural justice. The second major principle of natural justice that we wish to discuss was referred to as audi alterum partem, or let the other side be heard. This is also referred to as the rule of fair hearing. Now, it doesn't take shape or take 
um, doesn't become manifest just by letting the other party be heard. That's one of the basic principles articulated by that statement, but it comprises a, 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 an entire set of conditions for us to think that due procedure has been followed. The idea of the rule of fair hearing is considered to be the first principle of civilized nations. In other words, we distinguish a country that has the rule of law from those who don't have the rule of law if they uphold this principle of fair hearing. That makes natural or intuitive sense. Some country that's under a dictatorship or a tyranny or something like this can just condemn people for no reason whatsoever. You may recall from a um, particularly uh, sad moment in history, the killing fields in Cambodia, that there was a time when the dictator, Pol Pot, decided simply to kill everybody who had glasses. The reason he assumed that people who have spectacles or glasses are um, reading too much, they're members of the intelligentsia, and the intelligentsia or intellectuals can be dangerous to a dictatorial regime. So he simply decided, if you have glasses, you will be eliminated. Now, this is as savage as you can get, and it's a clear violation of this idea that you give each person a fair hearing. In other words, are you, um, each person could have been asked, are you uh, acting in opposition to the interests of the state or something like that? You don't just give some blanket arbitrary rule and then convict or condemn people according to that arbitrary rule. It's very important to note that hearing means fair hearing. So just a hearing is not enough if the judge is not listening. The principles of achieving a fair hearing aren't a matter of mere formality. There have to be some substance in, in, in this. And we can break that down to include things like notice. Each person should receive notice of what he's um, accused of. A hearing, in other words, he should be allowed to come and give his view on that notice. Cross-examination. Let's say that the prosecution or the people who are accusing present some kind of expert testimony or witnesses in order to justify the accusation. Well, the person who is being accused should be allowed to cross-examine those witnesses and to question that evidence. You can't just have a number of people say, yes, he did it, yes, he did it, without the person who's being accused interrogate them and ask the nature of their uh, knowledge and whether it's valid and so on. Legal representation is another. The legal system is very complicated and complex. In this paper, we've dis been discussing the philosophy of law, which in itself is very complex. Imagine you add on to that all of the case laws, the codes of procedure, and all of the customary practices in law courts. You can expect to take a common man who is accused, place him in this very complicated system, and expect him to have a fair outcome unless he is represented by someone with genuine knowledge of the way the system works. So legal representation is included within the principle of natural justice of fair hearing because you can't have a fair hearing since no one would be able to hear what a person completely uninformed about the legal system is saying unless it is put forward in the way that is acceptable and customary in the law courts. Finally, there's also receiving evidence. So the um, nature of receiving evidence should be conditioned by these ideas of impartiality and fairness. So this audi alter impartum seems like a simple, straightforward uh, statement to hear the other side. But when you implement this basic principle of natural justice substantively, you realize that an entire uh, institution needs to be developed in order to allow this principle of natural justice to be realized. So you'll need legal, you'll need a, a legal framework, a set of um, uh, a pool of uh, attorneys willing to defend each defendant. You'll need processes of cross-examination, impartiality in detecting witnesses. You'll need a, a bureaucratic administration to issue notices and to receive notices and things like that. So this. Uh, this idea of natural justice, for it to be substantively realized, requires an entire set of institutions. Now we'll turn to the third and final, and as I had said, most recent introduction of a principle of natural justice, and that's 
what we call speaking orders in India or reasoned decisions in um, most of the world. The expectation that every order should be a speaking order or a reasoned order is also in conformity with the basic ideas of natural justice and, and um, you can see that it follows from the principles of justice like we had seen in, in Rawls. So it conforms both with ancient and contemporary senses of what the nature of justice is. What it demands is that when a judge makes a decision, he doesn't only give you the conclusion, but he gives you all of the reasons that lead to that conclusion. So if, for example, I'm um, uh, adjudicating or deciding a case whether a certain uh, uh, accused, uh, a thief, let's say, has committed the crime and then how much jail time he should serve as a consequence, I can't simply decide judgment, guilty, jail time, two years, and leave it at that. I need to determine on what basis it is clear that this person is guilty and on what basis the two years jail time, which could have been one, which could have been five, was selected. So this is what we refer to as a speaking order or a reasoned order because everybody should understand the reasons behind why a person was convicted and how, what, what justifies his sentencing. If that is not publicly accessible, then we violate the basic idea that we know of as justice should not only be done, it should also be seen to be done. How we see it to be done is by understanding the judicial reasoning behind the way the process unfolded. Now let's turn from the principles of natural justice in the abstract to the way that we see them at work within the Indian constitution and the Indian legal system. The principles of natural justice, as I had mentioned, date back to practices within ancient India, and it's not at all alien to uh, uh, centuries of uh, legal practice in, in this country. So it has multiple set of sources. It has indigenous sources in Indian history, and it also has the sources of the introduction of British colonial rule when the, um, the Judaic and uh, uh, Greek and Roman traditions of natural justice were also included. So the principles of natural justice appear in various manners throughout the Indian legal and judicial and administrative framework. In the constitution of India, the word natural justice or the, the term natural justice is not explicitly used but we can see how this concept, which has such a rich and varied history, is woven throughout the, the Constitution. The preamble of the Constitution has very clear expressions that are representing the spirit of natural justice. Additionally, there are specific clauses. You can think about the Equality Clause in Article 14, the Right to Personal Liberty in Article 21, and other clauses like 22, 39A, and 311, each of which assume that natural justice is at play. In other words, no one, uh, for example, Article 21 states that no person can be deprived of liberty without due process of law. Now, what is that other than to say in a more um, uh, clear manner than the uh, Latin formulation the, that audi alteram partem. So let the party be heard. You will not uh, violate someone's liberty unless through due process of law. That due process of law is of course that substantive framework that we had mentioned about notice and hearing and evidence and cross-examination and representation. This is due process of law. So you can see clearly that Article 21 presupposes the framework of natural justice as it clarifies our basic liberties under the Indian Constitution. Despite that we have um, a clear adherence to, to uh, the principles of natural justice, in every country and under every regime, democratic or not, there are possibilities to temporarily exclude the principles of natural justice from being applied. Now these have to be deeply exceptional circumstances because the principles of natural justice are precisely that, the natural state of justice. So as every political regime is set in place, 
supposedly to fulfill or to allow justice to flourish, the exceptions to justice must be very rare exceptions in the history of any nation. So one of the possibilities of the exclusion of the principles of natural justice assumes that if there is no possibility of injustice arising without following the principles of natural justice, then you can make an exception to implementing the principles of natural justice. What kind of an example can we think of where that happens? Generally, the easiest way to think of an example is if a person is going to be acquitted clearly based on the evidence. So if an accused person is um, if there's enough body of evidence for an accused person to be acquitted just based on the evidence, it, the judge might decide there is no need to hear the accused person considering that he's about to be acquitted anyway. So you can violate that principle that the accused should always be heard when the evidence is in itself clear enough to acquit the person without the, um, uh, the appearance of that party. It's far more difficult to think of exceptions where prosecution takes place, but perhaps uh, uh, we can conceive of such exceptions as well. Now, one of the only possible uh, understandings of the, of the latter, where so a certain prosecution is going to take place, that we can conceive of, is of course in a state of war. In the state of war, it is not only extremely inefficient, but it violates the very idea behind war, which is victory, to start to implement natural justice before each troop pulls the trigger. In other words, you can't interrogate each person that you're battling, um, whether he is opposed to your side, opposed to your government, or um, would, uh, uh, would be willing to uh, discuss uh, peaceful negotiations. Things just don't work like that. You attack, you shoot, you kill you violate the principles of natural justice in so doing, but the very state of war is that kind of emergency or exceptional situation where the principles of natural justice seem to be, um, seem to be uh, less possible to, to uh, introduce. But we're talking about a battlefield. Let's say that you've captured prisoners of war. Now clearly, prisoners of war should be subject to enjoy the same principles of natural justice as anybody else. In other words, you won't condemn or execute a prisoner of war without some sort of trial. So once the emergency situation of a battlefield is uh, no longer uh, 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 obtaining, and we come back to a more slow and civil situation, then clearly the principles of natural justice must be uh, reintroduced. So let's conclude uh, what we've been discussing in terms of natural justice and um, its implementation. The principles of natural justice are guiding procedural norms. We've seen this in the Indian Constitution as due process of law. These norms aim at the prevention of miscarriage of justice. Miscarriage of justice is another phrase that appears very frequently in Indian legal framework. And it's provided by an independent, impartial, and unbiased adjudicatory body, whether that's a judge, a panel, or what have you. They should be not biased, impartial, and they should adjudicate in line with fair procedures that have been set down through the substantive implementation of the principles of natural justice. And when they make their decision, that decision should be reasoned. Those decisions should take form as spoken orders. Justice, then, we see, is an ideal. But that ideal is very much implemented in law around the world. In fact, it's the very basis upon which we decide whether a country adheres to the rule of law or not. We can't attain this ideal in every course of action, but it is the ideal that should always be aspired towards, and when the circumstances permit, they should never be excluded. Thank you.